pretty busy. We do uh, clinics once a week, uh, so Wednesdays are always pretty steady for us. And uh, a lot of outreach, doing one on ones and workshops and classes still. I actually sponsored a fantastic uh, Muay Thai event last week here at the Canadian War Museum. It was called uh, Art of War Three. So it was put on by the Ontario Muay Thai Association, uh, Ottawa Fight and Fitness. So it was a good opportunity to go and talk about CBD for pre and post workout and also to, to watch the fights with fighter jets and tanks in the background. So it was a pretty cool, pretty cool experience. Welcome to the Cannabis Business Podcast. I'm your host, Milton. As a cannabis entrepreneur, how do you become better at what you do? I ask questions of other business leaders. I welcome Angelo Muscari of Hybrid Farm. He has worked in the marijuana industry for more than five years, educating patients about symptoms and treatment. He has a passion for cannabis, and I'd like to welcome him to the show. How did you get started with cannabis? It's not something that everybody gets into, but how did you get into cannabis? Yeah. Uh, so I'm a, a former nurse's aide and physician's assistant. So I was uh, already in the medical field for, for many years, working with various clinics and doctors here in Ottawa. Uh, and I actually stumbled across a referral form from National Access Cannabis one day uh, and then realized it was just a few blocks away from where I was. So I literally got out of my seat and, and walked over there in my scrubs and had a conversation uh, with the staff there. And not much longer after that, I was uh, managing the clinic here in Ottawa and then kind of expanding from there. So kind of just fell into it because I do have a passion for cannabis. I've been a good advocate. Besides that, uh, when I'm not at work and, and, and uh, a bit of a connoisseur and user my whole life. So it just kind of was a really rare and unique opportunity that I could bring two of my passions together. So it was uh, kind of meant to be, in my opinion, and uh, it's been going great ever since. I knew I was self-medicating at a young age for various reasons, and it's just something that I kind of appreciated more than other medications that were offered to me at the time. Uh, I was also a young father. Uh, I had kids as young as 18. So it was just um, dealing with a lot of stress, uh, reality of life, and, and things like that. And it was my way of coping as opposed to... Uh, um, you know, other other addictions or crutches, whatever you want to call them at, at that age, be it alcohol uh, or, or other drugs of choice. So definitely a live and learn kind of situation where there's ups and downs and cannabis has just always kind of been a part of my life, whether it's been positive or negative in the past, it's just been part of the journey and it's been uh, been good to me for the most part. Yeah. At a young age too, in that social aspect, where as much as you don't want to admit it at the time in high school, like there are cliques and cliches, right? So you have, you know, your typical group of, of stoners or, or cannabis users at your school that you can always remember or that you did or didn't associate with. There's the jocks, there's the uh, the people who are, are, are more into, you know, uh, more boozing and drinking. And that does kind of set you on a certain path in some way with who you associate with, how you associate with, how you socialize, like you said, at a party. Are you somebody who's capable of holding their alcohol so it's not really impairing you? Are you someone who's known to slur your words and be sloppy at parties because you overdrink? Are you someone who's known to be kind of always very closed eyed because you're very high? You know, it, it, it's interesting to see how it's really come full circle from recreational to be, to me, being involved in medicinal to then recreation becoming legal to now dealing with the plights of medicinal again, right? It's kind of been like a scale has been going this this way constantly. And the goal for everyone, I think, on both sides of the fence is, is balance uh, across the country, whether it be recreational or medical now to, to find balance and to find how we all fit into the same, same puzzle using different pieces. To hear that you're from Ottawa or are in Ottawa took me by surprise. It's not Toronto, let's just say. It's not Toronto, you know, and then as, as far as the Canadian cannabis scene goes, you know, Ottawa does get overlooked a lot. It's not Toronto. It's, it's not British Columbia. That being said, it, it is a government town. You know, there's still lots of fun to be had here. If you ever come down, people can shoot me a message and I'll send you some pl cool places to go and some fun things to do. But as far as like a really aggressive cannabis scene, there is one. Uh, it, it's here. It's not too big. It's, it's not as large as the other major metropolis cities and there's definitely at this point in time right now zero dispensaries they've all been kind of shut down 100 percent. i do believe there's a few sprinkled throughout uh, the gta still uh, you know I, I could be wrong and then i was recently just in vancouver uh for a lift expo out there and uh was able to visit that first official legal dispensary that was in the news at that time got to meet some really great individuals there from from again both sides and it was like again like a whole different kind of scene and scenario so auto is definitely very on the political side and it's it's interesting because we still have, as, as many know, a lot of licensed producers in Ontario. From where I am right now at my location, uh, hydropothecary is not too far, you know, 25 minutes. Tweed's not too far at all. And then again, in Ontario, you have like Peace Naturals close by, Weed MD, Greenleaf. It's, it's here, but it's, it's definitely the opposite side of 
the culture, right? It's very medical based. It's very government heavy. Working in Ottawa, you've definitely seen both sides of the story a little bit more at times, I think. And same with Toronto, I would assume. It's just that I feel like Toronto has more voices on both sides, a, a little more representation on both sides, you know, like, like there's more advocates that are kind of doing more work and they kind of have a little more say in, in how things kind of move forward for the most part. Yeah, here it's definitely kind of more one-sided on the, on the government uh, level, which, which helps, you know, and, and can hinder at times. I did want to ask you, I know there's another half of you. Uh, well, he's my colleague and I do work for him. He's the, uh, he, he's the brain and, and, and owner of uh, Hybrid Farm. He's uh, also a pharmacist. That would be my colleague, uh, Dr. Raheem Dalla. So we met a year ago this month, last March, and came to, to meet Raheem to understand that he was a, a cannabis user as well growing up and, and quite fond of the plant and even more so to study it uh, from a pharmaceutical point of view. And then also had a, a personal engagement with his father before his passing with cancer with some minor cannabis use that really helped his, his dad's symptoms at the time. Again, really kind of putting that personal touch on things. When we met, it just very much clicked and it's been a, a great partnership being able to learn from each other, uh, grow hybrid farm together, and, and see how we can really affect individual people day by day. On that note, hybrid farms, one of the first times I got more familiar with the name, um, I'd been standing next to someone talking about cannabis, and I pointed to your uh, booth uh, when we were at the Ottawa Hemp Expo. He immediately shivered. He, there's this kind of stigma sometimes, not related to you or the business, but I think the pharmaceutical industry in general. It's, it's something that we knew we'd be battling from day one. He is able to crush that stigma very easily and quickly, not only with his knowledge, but with his just personality and attitude, not to cannabis, but also to all other medications, right? We're not here to change anyone's mind or to say, this is for you. It's just offering somebody, again, another tool in their medicinal toolbox, but in our opinion, giving them actual proper guidance, unlike other unfortunate, you know, clinics or, or licensing avenues inside Canada. I'm not going to name names. It's just, you know, I've been in that situation and, and, and my past experience, I'm confident that we did good work. So it's able to take what we learned from in the past and, and bring it together as a unit here at Hybrid Farm. And that's how we can become Canada's first and only compounding pharmacy specializing in medical cannabis. Uh, again, again, another benefit of, of us creating this is that we have a pharmacist that can do a full med check with you, can give you uh, guidance if there's any red alerts that something might not go well with cannabis. You have the, the guidance of someone like myself who can help you with your strain selection, terpene selection, really break down your individualized medications, how you medicate, when you medicate. You know, this is alternative medicine, so people have exhausted all their other options, or some people are not confident in having their medications raised again. Unfortunately, on, on the pharmaceutical side, and we can say that being a pharmacy as well, it's not healthy to have a silver bullet method for every issue with every person. And that's where cannabis differs, is that you can treat cannabis as an individualized medication per person. Again, it's not always going to work, but uh, a lot of people are here because they want to try and they're ready to jump in with both feet with proper guidance. We offer people first access or information to give to their healthcare practitioner. So we give them medical documents, which are blank or blank referral forms. So much like if you were to see your doctor and had uh, a throat or ear issue, normally they would refer you to an ear, nose and throat specialist. So we give up them the opportunity to refer to us, the cannabis specialists, if, if they're not comfortable with the first option of prescribing. Uh, another option is for people to come in and fill out other paperwork and, and build some rapport and build some kind of clinic profile to then perhaps see our nurse practitioner, who we do have here on staff as well. That's another option for people to receive their license. Uh, and we also offer telemedicine to anyone who qualifies uh, throughout the province of Ontario. So we can see people in the comfort of their own home or people with mobility issues, maybe people that are in assisted living situations, uh, stuff like that. I'm kind of curious about Ottawa as a city uh, for cannabis. Every city or every region seems to have its own story for how cannabis got started or the community. Uh, you may not know the answer to this question, but was it difficult to operate and to start the business? I think in this business particular, it wasn't as much of a culture shock as it was a few years ago. For example, when uh, I started to work at National Access Cannabis, not too far from here, you know, just a, a few, uh, some city blocks away in the Hindenburg area. And that was a bit of a culture shock to some people, um, not really knowing what that system was, uh, you know, being a medical cannabis clinic, access education center. But because of the way that we approached it being open and, and having a kind of comfort level and uh, a comforting setting put people at ease and kind of 
allowed them to ask the questions that maybe they didn't feel comfortable asking in the past. And with that being said, now with April around the corner in here in Ottawa with brick and mortars coming for recreational sales, I just do honestly think it'll bode well for us because people will have more questions and concerns. You will have people who will start coming out of the cannabis closet because it's now legal. So people do have questions. They want to experiment. Nothing wrong with that. But the staff at a lot of these locations are limited to to what they can do with medical advice. So that's the big separation, you know. People who will want to treat it as a Friday night kind of fun thing, they have that opportunity. And anyone who does want to treat it more like a medicine, get more serious, has that opportunity to come visit someone like us here at Harbor Farm. It, it, it did all start with medical. This this whole fight started with medical. Uh, you know, veterans played a big part in this. Uh, you know, great market associates played a big part in this. That's the history of cannabis. It's a, it's, it's a wild and colorful story, you know. I'll do a plug for a book that I think is fantastic by Joel Dolce. It's called Brave New Weed. And it's just an exciting read about how a lot of the, the wackiness ensued in, in the United States with uh, cannabis. There's a fun fact in there. The first person in the States who was ever charged with cannabis possession in the 1800s. It's wild to see this history of hemp and cannabis. And the LP Med Relief had a fantastic looking poster. And it was like kind of like a timeline history. I've been lucky enough to go to Smith Falls to, to Tweed, where they have a fantastic visitor center. It's almost like a cannabis museum. And the film that they have there that you can sit down on a huge screen really does, does like a whole kind of A to Z history of cannabis. Again, really hitting on points that people should be aware of. The history of hemp, the fact that it was such a major part of trade throughout history, the fact that you know hemp was almost demanded to be grown in, in certain states. And that's now coming in full circle as we see CBD and hemp regulated in different fashions. Another thing that I actually posted via my other social account, Smoke the Stigmas, was a video by MedMen directed by Spike Jones that was just released this week, and again, about the history of cannabis. And it really hits home in regards to how we wrongfully and unlawfully, you know, put so many people behind bars these past 20, 30, 40 years for possession of a plant. And now it's legal and now people are making tons of money off it. And it's that's where a lot of the separation still stands, right, between medical and recreation. And, you know, 15-year-old me really had high hopes for certain things when recreation came. But my honest response is that it, it's not handled as well as it could be. And from a medical point of view, because that's my nine to five and I'm dealing, end of the day, it's, it's, it's us here, people like us or people, you know, that work in other, other clinics that are doing their job properly where we're dealing with the patients end of the day dealing with their lack of supply dealing with their not being able to afford their medication you know and we all know that there's a lot of negative things involved and our goal here daily is to still kind of solidify a system that benefits everyone treating it like a medication once a din number happens once a drug identification number happens with cannabis unfortunately it's going to be kind of sickening to see how many people's attitudes switch like that because it's now simply covered. It can be scribbled on an RX sheet from a doctor. A lot of people won't even won't even think about it. And that's unfortunately end of the day where I just stress to people, if you want to treat it like a medicine, ask a medical professional. It's like Facebook where I see a lot of these groups of people asking, and it's great that there's support and there's communities out there. But some of the serious questions I see them ask and the responses they get, I'm like, this, you have to talk to a doctor. Even don't even, you know, I consider myself quite knowledgeable, but not even myself. Like I wouldn't even touch that question. Like there's certain things that you have to talk to people because, by the way, are you on blood thinner or blood medications? Because you mentioned you had X, Y, and Z as well. So the medical community, I think, is continuing to support each other in a, in a, in a fantastic way. There's great resources out there. Yeah, so it's it's a never-ending daily kind of battle, but one that I'm always excited to wake up and take on because it's it's uh, it's exciting to be part of this ever-changing industry that my kids, being a father of four, will have something hopefully to look back on in a bit to, to say that we did make a difference one way or another. One of the reasons I, I separated medical and recreational was because I wanted to highlight the, something that makes you different. You're a pharmacy, which yeah. is very different than some other medical kind of clinics. And I wondered if you could say a little bit more about that piece. Yeah. So because we are a compounding pharmacy, that means that we can compound medications. That means we can remove things from medications, add things to medications. Uh, we can flavor things, pediatrics, pets. It truly gives our compounder and pharmacist the ability to create something for an individual. And that uh, coincides with cannabis, right? So if you need maybe 
decarb put into a dose set into capsulized form a certain exact amount of THC and CBD, that's something that we can do. Maybe you want to create a certain topical or bomb for, for localized pain relief with a, a heavy terpene uh, content of a certain terpene. You know, that's, it's all about personalized compounding. It's going back to the apothecary days in the 1800s you know, when we would still mull certain herbs t- together as, as a pharmaceutical world to, to help alleviate certain symptoms. Um, and again, not having it be the only option, but another tool in that toolbox. So we do hope that people look at this as, as a pharmacy of the future, a, a way to incorporate all aspects of healing. And that's also why we do things like workshops, uh, yoga, meditation, acupuncture, cooking with cannabis, how to grow cannabis, really making sure patients get the most out of their medication. It's, it's really important for someone who has a green thumb to know they can grow their own medication or someone who's comfortable in the kitchen to know that they can cook with their own medication and, and really have more control uh, of, of how they use cannabis. You also have an interest in being part of the community. Yeah, I, definitely. Especially, uh, so like, like we mentioned, like I'm born and raised Ottawa. So, uh, you know, I, I, I love my city. It's a fantastic community. Uh, there's so many amazing things here from, uh, local breweries to yoga studios. Like right now in this area, we're surrounded by all kinds of exciting people. And this is an opportunity to really showcase in a safe environment and, and in a comfortable environment what cannabis can do for some people, right? And, and it's good because it helps people really ask the questions that they want to get answered. In regards to building community, it, it's, it's fantastic when we get asked by, you know, local old age homes or local uh, veterans groups, you know, to come and talk. It really shows that people are now open to something that their whole life was considered taboo. So when we can provide proper education and access and then really have an open and honest conversation, that really changes the stigma. So again, this is just the beginning of something in the next three to four years. It's funny how I mentioned to some of my colleagues who I've been doing this a long time with, if you would have told me that four or five years ago, I'd still be doing cannabis 101s, I'd be like, no, you know, I'm pretty sure people will become coming around, but it's, it's, it's actually the opposite where I'm doing even more because of it being so much in the open. Yeah. It's just, it's ongoing and ever changing. And that's also the most exciting part about it besides being the most challenging. I was doing a little research on Manulife and Shoppers Drug Mart. The story in Nova Scotia, a person challenged a labor board or human rights board, said uh, that their group insurance wasn't covering his medical marijuana. I guess a certain cascading effect happened with uh, insurance companies. Manual life being one of them, I think great financial. And- we actually, um, as a resource for our patients, we have a list of all current uh, insurance companies and what they are covering. An honest response is that a lot of them, it's quite intense. You have to have stuff like, you know, stage four cancer, HIV, AIDS. But a lot of other companies are coming full circle with doing per case management. So they'll look at the individual. Again, if you look at the chronic pain patient or maybe someone who in the past their epileptic medication was working, but now cannabis is a better option. It comes down to cost, right? It comes down to why is something not covered when something else is costing like hundreds of dollars, right? A lot are doing like an as an, an as per person. Kind of, they're looking at the individualized case files, which is good. What I tell my patients is, do you if you have any sort of insurance, make the claim. Just start making the claims. I mean, and you probably get rejected, but the fact is that people need to be aware. People need to know that this is considered a medication. It's working. Something that we've been kind of looking into as well is the motor vehicle accident world and, and vehicle insurance. We've been in talks with representatives from that world, and, and there seems to be a lot of positive uh, information of people getting full coverage of their medication via that route. I can't speak too much on it yet because I'm not uh, fully educated on it. It's something that we're looking into, but it seems to be that a lot of people under certain circumstances, they were involved in a motor vehicle accident, and because of that, are using medical cannabis, are getting full coverage. So again, in my honest opinion, everything goes back to the DIN. I think once that happens from a pharmaceutical standpoint, people won't even blink an eye. You should be able to come pick up your medical cannabis here just like you do your Tylenol or any other medication. Do you take any position on the uh, tax? Yeah, it's ludicrous. It's Again, it's the only thing in the country double taxed, let alone tax. It's just there's no need for it, and everyone's well aware of that. Again, if you want to look at the history of how this worked, you know, 
in the past people were just your license meant you were given permission to grow your own cannabis no one batted an eye no one cared it wasn't until they started producing cannabis to make their money themselves that now it's the whole system in place and obviously that's the way it's going to go it's the way the world works but there's still a lot of fine tuning to be done from a medical point of view in my opinion because there's too many people depending on things that are not in constant supply that are just far too expensive and that are regulated to a point of absolute just ridiculous I'm just going to be clear about the tax issue, just the uh, audience or people who are listening understand. Yeah. The idea is that the tax should not be applied to people who are medical users because affordability is an issue for many. Would you like to add something? A mantra I use with my patients is called the beauty and curse of cannabis. The beauty being you're in control. For the first time for many people, you're in control of how you medicate, when you medicate, with what medication. The curse can be just that for a lot of people, though, is that you have to experiment. They don't want that. They're used to the take two, call me tomorrow approach, right? And also the curse of having to pay out of pocket, sometimes a lot of money for a product that once you do try, perhaps may not be for you, may not work. Now you're left with something. So I do get questions sometimes, like, can I return product? Well, you know, unfortunately, the answer is no. But, you know, most LPs are doing are doing their hardest. Uh, I've seen the progression in the past few years. They're really trying to do their best to, to have proper, you know, customer feedback, customer service. Again, being limited to not being able to give medical advice unless you would be in contact with a medical professional, which some do offer. And I think it's it's that change that has to happen. It's really dedicating the right people to be in the right place to give people information, access, and and, and product when they need it at a reliable price. Maybe me and you could have this conversation in three years when everything's fully covered, and it'll be a whole different conversation. If you had to give any insight to policymakers about how the future could be you know, better for the work that you're doing with cannabis? A lot of doctors in the medical world will always state that they, you know, they want trials and tests, and you know, they want their phase one, their phase two done, and, and that, that, that's acceptable, you know, like any other thing. Because this is not taught in medical schools, uh, fine detail, there's so many people in doubt, right? There's that stigma involved. So I'm aware of that. It's just that people who, who are still using and finding success and just don't have the patience and time, they're not aware of that. They don't know that there's a whole process involved to, to get a drug to market, for example, you know? Although it is technically to market, in my opinion, it's here. The system has been in place. You know, the, mon- the money speaks for itself, right? The fact that there is a supply issue speaks for itself. So this is in demand. It's just, again, having to fine tune it and, and how long this will take, I don't know, you know, but there has to be something put in place for, for low income, for, you know, ODSP is something here in Ontario for, for, for pediatrics, like focus on pediatrics, focus on these children who are, 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 are really, really needing stuff like cannabis oil or THCA, as we mentioned earlier, you know, for seizures, like there's so many people who could benefit from just having that burden of pain out of pocket a lot of money for, for a product that potentially could really, you know, change somebody's life. You know, I was told a little while ago that uh, one of the biggest problems is uh, the failure of government to communicate what cannabis yeah. is. They have to talk to the right people, talk to the patients using it, you know, make support groups, talk to the organizations that are willing to be involved, like talk to Epilepsy Ontario, you know, talk to the LPs that are doing studies with local universities or stuff like that. Like Tilray's always been very involved. Green Relief is is involved, Believe's involved. Every LP has some sort of involvement. And I I, I know for a fact, you know, being, being involved in this industry for a while now, it's People are trying, but there's a lot of red tape, as we know. If you if you look at this just like any other medication, who's to say that cannabis gets to be put in front of a line, right? So everyone has to have patience. You know, people need to do their due diligence, cross their T's and dot their I's. This reminds me of a commercial I heard on the radio yesterday here in Ottawa where you can call a 1-800 number as a parent to have a mock call with a teen before you talk to your teens about cannabis. And I'm still kind of on the fence of how I feel about this. I think it's very... Very smart and unique to have that capability, you know, to, to call that number to, to, to try that. Because for a lot of parents who aren't users, never even thought of speaking about cannabis with their kids, they're faced with this, with this conversation now. At the same time, there's no hotline for alcohol. Um, or maybe we can start with also the mention sometimes because, yeah, it, it's, it's a recreational thing, but it's also a medicine. And I think that's a real hard thing. Uh, for the first time in history, something is a recreational and a medicinal product. And it's really hard. You know, you, it's not that both sides are going to war, but when you talk about rules and regulations, oof, 
it, it's going to be a long time until it's it's really kind of streamlined and people on both sides are, are, are happy with with how it's all kind of rolling out. I'm sure you're more aware of this than I am. The Canadian Medical Association, their policy statement is that they're not in support of medical marijuana, but the Pharmaceutical Association of Canada is saying they are in support of uh, having people put in positions like pharmacies, give it uh, information. Like shoppers now at the moment, so like with Shoppers Drug Mart, you have access to medical cannabis via their online system. What it means is your prescription is now theirs. And with that, you have access to, I believe, six or seven, seven or eight different licensed producers. And I believe a call center where you can ask some questions. It's something. It's a start. As much as I do kind of mock it at times, you know, uh, it's something, you know. Again, ask 15-year-old me if I ever thought I could go online to Shoppers Drug Mart and order weed. No, I, it's mind-blowing, you know. So from us here at Hybrid Farm, it, it's it's people in the pharmaceutical world doing something like what we want to do. So it's inspiring. And it's also a way to learn from their mistakes, in all honesty, and to see how we can also collaborate potentially in the future. It's a very small industry, this, this medical cannabis industry. Uh, I see a lot of the same people uh, at the same conventions. It, it's exciting to see the growth uh, from different avenues. Uh, Every time I see like a new doctor who I've always kind of been a fan of really kind of stepping up to the plate and doing a good talk or willing to pitch in with a, a trial or, an, or, or, or testing of something, that's exciting. And, and that's, that's how we're going to move forward. I'm in Montreal. I'm not saying that I'm very plugged into the medical cannabis community. I'm sure that they're doing some wonderful things out there. But uh, I don't see a lot of uh, education activities happening here in Montreal. We're always willing to come down and do, a, do, a, do an education session. Because I would love to personally be able to do it as well. Of course, science yeah. space. Well, that, I mean, that's a question I get a lot by people of the past few years is like, how can I get involved? And my response is just like, whatever you do well already, just continue to do that and see if you can incorporate cannabis into it. Don't try and reinvent the wheel. If you're a good artist, you focus on, uh, on something cannabis related. If you're good in the kitchen, focus on some sort of personalized recipes. If you like to write, Maybe you can do reviews or work for a licensed producer in, in their journalism side. There's so many opportunities. This, this is the beginning of something new again, you know. I'm a father of four. I have two adult children and, and two younger. My, my older two are well aware that they, they live in a time where if you want to work in cannabis, you can, you can get in on the ground floor right now in some opportunities and really, really make a difference and work your way up, which is exciting. Part of your job is to educate and inform health professionals. I'm wondering if you could say a little bit about the issue of, of working to communicate with doctors. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much, uh, it's normally a good time. I mean, we have a very informative and detailed 101 presentation uh, uh, because, like I said, my colleague is, is a doctor and pharmacist. It's, it's nice to have his knowledge and, and his skills. And again, we can play off each other's kind of, uh, of strong points. So again, um, it's just really educating and taking a lot of time in the Q&A session at the end to make sure people can address their concerns and questions and keeping an open door policy at the clinic and, and open door contact via, you know, any patients who are looking for us to stay involved with their primary care. We're more than happy to uh, with as much detail as possible because from a medical point of view, you know, it's all about dictating. It's all about journaling. It's all about uh, efficacy. It's all about you know, numbers, how much is working for what, and look at fantastic programs like Strain Print or the Relief app. And those are two systems that people can track data on. It's great, you know. So the more things that we do like that, it can just continue to grow. And once studies kind of come full circle and we have more results, the, the, like the biggest bang might still be, in my opinion, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine published something a few months back about CBD and Dravet syndrome, which is a very harsh form of epilepsy. But it was it was it was a great kind of publication, and for a lot of doctors, it takes something that serious to be published for them to start looking to cannabis as an actual alternative option or alternative medication. My question about doctors and stigma isn't it an issue of dosage? They're just not sure how much to prescribe. Yeah, it's a major thing. So, for example, with your limits being one to five grams a day, if a doctor was going to check off that three gram a day box. Most are under the assumption that their patients now consuming three grams of cannabis a day, which is not the case at all. It's run by a monthly ordering system. So 30 days in a month times three means now that patient can order 90 grams of cannabis per month and possess on them at all times 90 grams. Again, the reason being most cannabis oils are the equivalent of either five or 10 grams of dried cannabis. So one 
bottle of CBD oil off your prescription is 10 grams off your prescription. That's the first checkbox on the form. So, so it, it, it's quite frustrating for them, you know. Uh, with our document, we, we try to be as open and, and give them as, as much clarity as possible. So, you know, they, they have the option to tick off uh, oils only. They can restrict the THC levels if needed. Because some doctors are educating themselves and becoming more knowledgeable. And that's the kind of relationships that we're eager to build in the medical world just to help move forward. There's a lot of stuff, too, like with youth and frontal lobe development, cannabis use. That, that, that's, a, that's a big hot topic. Uh, pregnancy, cannabis use, breastfeeding, cannabis use, because there's really nothing to pull from. There's no numbers. And end of the day, medical is a numbers game. Western medicine is, is pretty much by the book, right? So, so it's tough. You, you can look at like traditional Chinese medicine where cannabis is one of the top 10 essential herbs and has been for tens of thousands of years. They back it up with their, with their writings and with their knowledge, but it's, that, that's a different, that's a whole different system, right? So, but there's no reason why you can't, again, use that as just another tool in your medical toolbox, you know, take the pros from both of those worlds and, and see what you come up with. Cause you'll realize the more history and more reading you do in regards to many different worlds of medicine or apothecary care or herbal medication, cannabis has always played a, a pretty important role. So I was wondering if you had any advice to give anybody who would be either starting a business or any other thing that you can think about that you might want people to think. I think, I think maybe cannabis. going back to what I said about really making it your own, right? So in, using your unique skills and incorporating cannabis into that, that and also like we've discussed in this conversation, look at what your community needs, right? Start in your corner, start in your area, see what, can be done because you might find like-minded people looking to do the same thing. One of the questions I should be asking also is uh, you've gone to a couple of conferences and I'm just wondering what the most common kinds of questions people have for you uh, at the booth. If, uh, if we have any free samples. Is that right? <laughs> oh, yes, yeah. When I worked for National Access Cannabis, I think at one event, we started to take a tally, and once it got to a point, we are just like, forget it. And it's, you know, it can be draining after you get asked so many times, but uh, no, I mean, just your typical, your typical questions. Again, at a conference, you get experienced cannabis users, naive users. You get people there looking for dollars and cents. You get people there looking for medical answers. You get people there just because they stumbled upon the event. It's the beauty of cannabis. You get so many different people in, in this unique bubble, right? Because it's an individualized medication, people have the ability to really hone into what they love about cannabis. Maybe they love edibles. Maybe they love flour. Maybe they're uh, a terpene junkie. Maybe like, there's so much you can do with something that's as versatile as cannabis and for that matter, hemp. You know, you look at the manufacturing of hemp and uh, hempcrete, those bricks that are made from hemp is still something that blows my mind. I love stuff like that. It, it's fantastic, right? So there's a lot of opportunities. Um, some good friends of mine at uh, Boveda, uh, a company that makes the humidity packs, that, that started in the cigar world. But they saw the need for something like humidity control and cannabis. They hit it out of the park. There's a lot of areas that you can grow, no, no pun intended, uh, in this industry. Yeah, you look at uh, a company like Lord Jones in the States who is just, oh, in the past four or five months, I wish I had, I wish I bought their stocks. If they have stocks, I don't know. They're an example of a company who, who is, from a marketing point of view, doing things the right way. There's been, in the past week and a half, it's stuff like the New Yorker and the Guardian, just all about, you know, what is the hype of CBD? CBD is the superstar right now. It's in the spotlight. But that will change, you know, as time moves forward. And uh, again, from, from my nerd kind of point of view, there's a lot that's going to happen once we start isolating things differently, once we look at other cannabinoids. You know, from a, from a pharmaceutical point of view, I think it is a necessity that pharma gets involved to see how we can manipulate this product to, to, to give it in different dosage form too, right? So, so it's interesting that the opportunities, in my opinion, are, are limitless. I have very, there's no ceiling right now, I think, in, in this industry. I'm writing um, a content piece on uh, the benefits of juicing. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I'm comparing um, dandelion and kale to cannabis, I get to see that there's amazing benefits to dandelion and kale, but that there's such lack of research related to the similar things for cannabis. 
Um, well, it's funny you mentioned like dandelion, for example. I grew up, uh, my parents uh, are, are Italian, uh, so we ate uh, quite a bit of dandelion salad growing up and reaped the benefits of like dandelion milk. When you look at cannabis ruderalis, like ditch weed as it's known, that is something that Europeans were also known to consume quite a bit of, you know. So, again, it's going full circle now with the health craze here nowadays with like all natural and that kind of stuff, you know, uh, botanicals. It's it's interesting to see uh, some people's reaction to things like like dandelion. I get passed off for everyone, right? Like if you tell someone, oh, I had dandelion salad, like what do you mean I had dandelion salad? Like yeah, it's it's a thing. It happens. So it, it's uh, it's it's interesting. It's uh, it's just going to continue to 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 expand and grow, and and then we'll see where it takes us. Once again, I'm going to say you and Raheem are more or less heroes in a way for me. In Ottawa and in Lanark and in that region, Eastern Ontario. You're having pockets of people who are, you know, little bits getting together, but over yeah. time you're going to be creating this larger community of people who are more aware of. Yeah, I think so. I agree. I think I think it's it's going to happen. It's just going to continue to grow, and that's that's one thing that we hope we do here. You know, as as we see the same people coming for you know continuous classes and stuff like that, we have our regulars, and then it's nice. I ask people who I interview about their idea of strains, what they choose or how they choose or how people should think about choosing. I know you're kind of in the middle of two worlds, you're uh, recreational and medical because you get to see people come in and there's prescribed needs. The reason I ask the question is because I, I need to educate myself and I also think the people who listen uh, get to learn. I mean, we yeah. learn about terpenes, uh, that sativa and indica are just nice labels. A lot of people will will state otherwise, but I think it's still a key foundation because it's so new to a lot of people. You have to keep sativas and indicas kind of as a base foundation. You have to keep THC and the CBD as the two main cannabinoids to focus on just for now. You know, and, and for, for someone who's naive or new, baby steps, take your time. Much, you know, uh, an easiest way for me when I deal with patients, especially if they are fans of wine, is to treat it the same way. Like some people like a Shiraz, some people do not. And you might learn that the hard way. An example is like a UK cheese strain. I don't like anything cheese related with cannabis. I find it smells like feet and Doritos. And it's not for me, you know, but for someone else, they might smell that and it might have that automatic click that just there's that euphoric effect of ooh that terpene's meant for me right that's like limonene for me in like a super lemon haze as soon as I smell a really well grown super lemon haze with a dominant you know nice limonene terpene that's it I'm sold right but that's that's me as an individual so I stress to people to really again journal and keep track as much as possible whether it be in pen and paper form or with one of the apps I mentioned. And just to, to, if they can, and if it allows them to, to, to experiment, you know, it's all about really seeing what does what you, you have to be aware of the negative aspects of cannabis prior to experimenting, obviously, but that really is going back to the beauty and curse of cannabis. If I have a patient coming to me with certain symptoms or a certain diagnosis, we're going to start at a certain area and at least let them know what to avoid to start their journey and, and offer them, you know, even simple things like a titration sheet with, 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 with their medication, if need be, you know, that's something unique that we can offer here as well. I guess once again, it's a good reminder of what makes Hybrid Farm uh, different. I went to a pharmacy this weekend because my sister had a certain uh, sore muscle. She wanted to look into some sort of relaxant for her muscles, just try to ease the pain. It's not things she normally gets. It was one of those random, no one can figure out how come she has it. When I had the conversation with the woman who was the pharmacy specialist, uh, she kept on asking me, just to be clear, is there any other medications? When you talk to patients about what their needs are, you're really looking into those kinds of issues about yeah. you know, what's complex. You don't want to mix things up. hundred percent, a hundred percent. In Ontario, there's something that we can offer because uh, it's covered by OHOOP. It's called the meds check. Just something as simple as sitting down with a pharmacist and having, you know, an open conversation about your medications and what's working and what's not. And that's an important thing to do before maybe even considering cannabis for a lot of people. And that's why it's uh, it's something that we do pride ourselves on. and It's something that we can offer to people, yeah.
What's happening in the next couple of months or year or so? Some, some good stuff. In the next few weeks, we have a, a vaporization 101 class that we're doing with, uh, in part with Da Vinci. So they're, they've been kind enough uh, to sponsor an event with us, and we have a great relationship with them, so that's exciting. Our next pharmacy card will be coming out, Omega-3s, Tilapia with Green Relief. Some more events coming with our in-house uh, holistic health coach, and we also have an in-house acupuncturist. We'll be doing some more educational events. I was recently just in the GTA at another pharmacy known as Pharmacy Zen, where we set up a small referral program that will be up and running soon. Any pharmacists or any medical people that are interested in, they're always free to contact us here if they have any questions about uh, being involved with Hybrid Farm. In a perfect world, I, I would like to start reaching out down south as well because it's cold here and I want to retire somewhere warm. So <laughs> that's my goal there. But yeah, no, just, uh, you know, it's it's been great. It's, uh, our clinics are full every week and it's seeming to pick up steam and uh, just kind of keep keep trucking along and making sure our patients are taken care of. Well, thank you, uh, Angelo. For me, it seems like a short interview, but... Uh, no worries. Yeah, it's been a pleasure, Melton. That's been good. I envy people like you who can go in front of people and, and answer questions. Uh, it takes some training or practice. I'm grateful that you're out there doing this this kind of thing. No, I appreciate it. No worries. Well, good luck uh, on everything that you're up to today, and thank uh, you. we'll connect up again soon, okay? All right. Sounds good. Bye, Melton. I hope you liked the show. If you have any suggestions or questions, feel free to contact me at milton at uxbigideas.com. Until next time, stay uplifted.